This is the story of the secret armies, funded by the United States, trained by Britain, and left behind in post-war Europe to fight the rise of communism. This is also the story of how they turned against their own people. This was the only bank in Milan that stayed open after 4 p.m. That day, at 4.30, I just signed a contract between two old farmers. A colleague called me, saying, come upstairs, I need you to give me some papers. When I arrived, I realized I had forgotten a receipt. I opened the window and tried to call these two people, but they couldn't hear me. So I closed the window and did quite an unusual thing. I leant against the glass. At 4.37 p.m. on the 12th of December 1969, a bomb exploded at the headquarters of the National Agrarian Bank in Milan's Piazza Fontana. It was an apocalyptic scene. Dead injured, safe deposit boxes sprung open. I started to cry, it's a bomb, it's a bomb, until someone from the police put their hand over my mouth and took me outside. Seventeen people were killed and eighty seriously wounded. My little son Ignatz came home from his first day at school and asked me, Dad, can we go to the Oktoberfest? So I said, OK, let's go. He went on the ghost train, and my daughter, who was older than him, cried when she came out. So my son called her a scaredy cat. Later I bought them a balloon and started to head home. But when we were close to the exit, suddenly... The bomb that exploded at the Munich Oktoberfest on the 26th of September 1980 killed 13 people and injured over 200. When I regained consciousness, I started to look for my children. First I found my little boy. I asked him, are you okay? He answered, it's nothing, Dad. I just feel cold. So I turned around and went a little further to where my daughter was lying. Her whole body was torn open. She said to me, and I will never forget these words, Dad, help me, will you? Then she died. My son had two bomb fragments right through his head. So both of my children died. I just can't help wondering, why? The dinner was ready and we were waiting for my daughter and my son-in-law and their two children. Saturday was our family day. All of a sudden I heard shooting from the Delhazy supermarket. We ran out to the terrace and my wife screamed, my children. I said, calm down, I will have a look at what happened. The doors to the supermarket were wide open, and the crowd was pushing out. I wanted to go in, against the tide, but people were saying, don't. People have been shot in there. Then they told me that my whole family had been shot. On the 9th of November 1985, a gang of armed men opened fire inside the Delaisy supermarket in Alst, Belgium. 
and there were eight killed and eight injured. Nobody understood. It was not classical uh, gangsterism. The slaying was just one of a staggering 16 similar attacks carried out between 1982 and 85 that came to be known as the Brabant Massacres. In total, 28 people died and 20 were injured. To this day, the killers have never been identified. René de Witt believes that it must be in someone's best interests, but they're never found. If you discover the killers, you probably also discover other things. Over a period of about 15 years, Europe was rocked by a series of terror attacks. The lives of thousands of people were turned upside down. But to this day, many aspects of the attacks remain a mystery. The bomb left in Milan's Piazza Fontana was one of the worst incidents, but 40 years on, no one has been convicted of the crime. Public prosecutor Guido Salvini has tried repeatedly to convict the men he believes were responsible for the bombing. When we reopened the investigation in 1991, no one had been found guilty. The only guilty verdicts were for General Maletti and Captain Labruna, who tried to derail the investigation. These two leading agents in the Italian Secret Service were sentenced to prison in 1979 for hiding and protecting key suspects. The secret services had definitely obstructed the work of the judicial authorities by hiding evidence and burying reports. And when certain people wanted to speak, it was decided that the best thing to do was plug the source, gag them, and say, we don't want to hear what you have to say. Investigators in other countries also found their inquiries sabotaged. The Munich blast was caused by a sophisticated pipe bomb just weeks after the attack, the police concluded that a lone extremist, Gundolf Köhler, had been responsible. Köhler had died in the attack. But numerous witnesses claimed they had seen Köhler in the company of two other people just before the explosion. Despite these sightings and Köhler's membership of a far-right paramilitary group, the police found no further suspects and closed the investigation. Ignaz Platzer and his lawyer Werner Dietrich believe they could be dealing with a cover-up. They want the inquiry to be reopened. Many of the witnesses who were interviewed by the criminal investigation department said we were made to feel as if we were the criminals. We were interviewed so harshly that we had the impression that the investigators had their own theory and that our evidence, which challenged this, was not welcome and was therefore painted as irrelevant or unreliable. There was something fishy about this story. The police just stopped investigating. I want justice. I want the real killers. For many years, the various European terror attacks were viewed as unconnected events, the work of local terrorists. But now there's evidence of a more sinister explanation. A car bomb in Italy, not long after the Piazza Fontana incident, helps shed some light on the other terror attacks in Europe. In 1972, near Petiano, in the northeast of Italy, a blast killed three policemen. Eventually, investigators trained their sights on Vincenzo Vinciguerra and his right-wing terrorist group Ordine Nuovo. Public prosecutor Felice Casson spent ten years investigating the attack. First of all, the extreme left was accused. And then, because this line of inquiry didn't hold up, the state accused small local gangsters. At a certain point, it became clear that the Carabinieri, the secret services, the police, and even the magistrate's office in Gorizia had all played a major role in trying to derail the investigation. Investigators discovered that members of the Carabinieri and the Gorizia magistrate's office had doctored and suppressed crucial evidence in a bid to implicate left-wing extremists. It was the entire apparatus of state that covered up the movements of these neo-fascists who carried out this massacre. 
Vincenzo Vinciguerra is now serving a life sentence for the Petiano attack. But testifying in court in the mid-1980s, he claimed that he and his right-wing group were protected and supported by a wider, shadowy organization that was connected at the highest levels to the military secret service. At the time, Vinciguerra's claims were dismissed, but Casson, who had brought him to trial, kept on digging. In 1990, Casson gained access to the archives of the Italian Military Intelligence Service and unearthed documents revealing a top-secret organization. What came out was the existence of a secret clandestine structure headed by the chief of the Italian secret services and codenamed Gladio, Stay Behind. Casson found documents that connected this mysterious force to NATO. The Italian Prime Minister, Giulio Andreotti, was forced to go public, causing a major European scandal. Andreotti admitted that the secret organization Gladio existed. He also revealed that it was part of a much wider network of secret stay-behind armies coordinated by NATO throughout Western Europe during the Cold War. Britain and the US had secretly trained and recruited civilians and military men in many European countries. Their role, according to the official version given by Andreotti, was to form a resistance movement in the event of a Soviet invasion. Stay Behind in Europe was set up by NATO. It was intended to create an organization that in the event of a, so of a Soviet invasion of Western Europe that there would be some kind of a structure that could conduct clandestine operations and maintain contact with the Western powers. We were in a very different time. We were still in the Cold War. There was confrontation between West and East. Europe was truly divided in two. People were thinking about a possible confrontation between NATO and the Warsaw Pact all the time. The Cold War in that sense is a time period which there was no peace. This was a war. It was a Cold War. Uh, and people died in the Cold War in, in, in a variety of ways. The Yalta Agreement of 1945 had divided the world into two blocks. The Allies and the Soviets would stop at nothing to maintain their influence in their respective spheres. In the early post-war years after Yalta, US spheres were dominated by the brutal Soviet takeover of the Eastern European countries and East Germany. Russia's gigantic military machine stood almost intact, by far the biggest still left in the world. The Allies' greatest concern was that the Soviets would march into the rest of Germany and even cross the Rhine. Historian Daniel Ganser is the first to have examined the stay-behind networks in Europe. NATO planners knew that the Soviet Union had a lot of manpower on European soil, so the Soviet Union could move very quickly to the Atlantic. And if you have such a situation, you must gain access to the territory again. And that was difficult. So they said, why don't we do it before? Okay, we set up arms caches, we, we, we put guns and munition and gold and whatever you need into these uh, arms caches, and we have people already trained who know each other. And um, these people then can become active in case of a Soviet invasion as a guerrilla. In very straightforward terms, uh, an organization, once it had been created, would nominate trusted individuals who would be uh, recruited to participate in Stay Behind. They would then undergo training and some of them would come to England. They would go to Fort Moncton, which is the SIS training facility just outside Gosport. And there they would be taught tradecraft, clandestine communications, exfiltration, infiltration techniques. And then once they had completed the course, they would return to their normal activities. Most likely they would be reservists. The concept of stay behind was born out of the Second World War experience of the Special Operations Executive, a branch of the British Secret Service, MI6. Special Operations Executive, its main role was sabotage in Europe. Working with networks in France, Belgium, they